Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our final Zoom webinar for 2022. We've enjoyed being able to keep our education going uh, through the, the Zoom option, although I really do miss seeing your faces when we were meeting in person on Saturday mornings. So I'm still hoping we're going to be able to return to that in 2023, but time will tell. You know, we just have to keep watching what happens with, with COVID and make sure that we all stay safe. So thank you for joining us. I'm Sandy Vandenberg. I'm Director of Plan Giving here at Torrance Memorial. And uh, I'm joined with great support in our control room today by our uh, media services team, Mitchell and Alex, and my colleague, Margaret is back there recording the questions that will come in and, and helping with support too. So thanks to the team in the control room. We um, bring you this series, it's called Taking Care of Your Financial Health. Uh, we think it's important for you to uh, look at that part of your life along with your medical health, um, physical health, I should say. And it's brought to our, we bring it to you with the support of our professional advisory council members. They're a group of estate planning attorneys, financial planners, CPAs, professional fiduciaries, and others who are involved with state planning. They support Torrance Memorial. Um, both financially with an, an annual gift along with uh, supporting us with education of the community on charitable tax and estate planning. So we really appreciate their support and giving of their time and expertise to help educate our community on these topics. So I emailed everybody who registered yesterday to provide the Zoom link and attach the handout for the PowerPoint that Chris is gonna present today. So you should have that. As I noted in my email, if you would like a printed copy mailed to you, I'm happy to do that. Just send me an email and uh, with, your, with your request and your mailing address so that I can get it out to you. We intended to have two presenters today, Chris Cordova and Connor Hartwell, but unforeseen circumstances prevented Connor from joining us today. So we'll hopefully include him in a future seminar and um, you'll be able to learn from him too. We like to hold all the questions until the end. So if you would please enter them in the chat on Zoom, you'll find it in the bottom part of your screen about in the middle. If you open that box up, uh, you'll be able to enter your question and then we'll address those at the end of the seminar today. So the, the screen should be set up for you to see the PowerPoint and the speaker at the same time. And uh, that will, you know, you do have some control over that so you can play around with it if it isn't working. but that should be um, easily seen by you. We are recording the seminar today, so it will be posted on our website. When it's posted there, I will email again everybody who has registered, and I have their emails. I'll send that, a link out to you probably sometime next week so you can review it, and the handout will again be available um, there. So if you didn't register in advance and you just logged in, please send me an email if you'd like that alert so that I can include you on that list. I always like to give a little highlight on what's going on at Torrance Memorial, and uh, we are really benefiting from the affiliation we have with Cedar sinai It's now, and it's uh, going on five years, I believe. And um, with the, the support we have from them, we will be opening a surge center in the building on Hawthorne Boulevard near Sky Park, where it's shown here on the, on this, the picture here, you can see um, the building, and it is um, where Berkshire Hathaway currently is. So this will be an outpatient orthopedic surge center, and it will allow uh, people to stay up to 23 hours um, after their procedure. And um, give us more capacity. Our, our operating rooms here at the hospital are very busy and we want to be able to continue to provide that service to those as they need it. Another um, great acquisition Cedars has just completed are these two buildings here, the 3400 and 3440 buildings. They're right here on the campus, adjacent to the hospital essentially. So uh, for future opportunity, future growth, we'll be able to um, expand the hospital. We can then also use the, a parking lot across the street maybe to add another parking structure. And um, so great possibilities in expanding the, the physical campus. So we are, are thankful again for the support we get through Cedars in um, the affiliation we have. 
But it's also great to, to um, remember that, Ed, Ed, as I mentioned, I'm in the foundation, all the funds we raise, they continue to stay just here at Torrance Memorial. That we have our independent board of trustees and foundation board, so we're still pretty independently run, but part of that affiliation along with Huntington Hospital now, Cedar sinai and then the Marina Del Rey campus. So it's, it has been a great uh, affiliation for us. Uh, I like to um, talk about some of the, well, before we get to this, I do want to mention, too, that we have some other lectures coming up. They're still via Zoom, our um, medical, our health lecture series, Miracle of Living. The next topic is on vertigo and dizziness. It'll be on September 22 at 6.30 via Zoom. You can find that on our website, the link for that. And um, the Medicare 101 monthly webinar continues to happen. There often are questions about Medicare. Our Torrance Memorial RP IPA does a great job with that. And the next one scheduled is September 28 at 6.30. So you can look online for those opportunities or email me. I'll send you the links um, to help you find them. Plan giving our, is the the opportunity to provide support to Torrance Memorial after you're gone. There are a number of different ways, the most common being the bequest, um, which you just include a gift in your will and trust. And um, some other things are listed there on the screen. So we, we are a nonprofit hospital and the support our community provides has been really key in continuing to have the latest technology and to continue to bring great doctors and uh, care for you right here in Torrance. Today we're talking about how to protect your retirement and so I thought it would be a good idea to just uh, you know spend a, a couple minutes on the whole scamming issue that's going on. I, I'm sure you are like me and you get these texts and these emails that um, you know try to play on your emotions and say you know you're your, um, there are suspicious charges on your credit card. So click this link and you know we'll help you solve it. Or a call from maybe the IRS, your taxes are overdue, we're gonna send out a warrant for your arrest. I remember hearing that in the past. Um, call this number immediately and you know we'll help you with it. Or um, the text uh, or, or a call from Amazon. You know, there's a suspicious charge on your account. Call us and we'll and or click on this link and we'll help you sort it out. Well, these are hackers who are trying to get your information and trying to steal your money. So just beware of all of these things. Some things to watch for are listed there. If, if there's urgent action needed, um, that's one of those things they're looking at your emotions, trying to get you to panic and do that. Watch for misspellings, poor grammar and irrelevant content in some of the emails you receive. You can also check the from address, and if, if it's not immediately showing, hover over that field, and, and it will show you that the email address is not from the company that is your bank or whoever it is they're trying to um, spoof. Uh, and don't click on those provided links. If you're getting an alert from Amazon or from UPS or, or the, you know, your bank, your credit card, Go to the number on your credit card or your bank, call them directly or log into your online account directly and that's the best way to know that you're actually clicking on the right kind of, of link to get that information. If whatever they're offering is uh, sounds too good to be true, it's probably a scam. So um, do watch out for that because you know you worked hard for those retirement assets you have and you don't want to have some uh, thief stealing them from you. So beware on, on those kinds of things. The, I, I mentioned a little bit the different types of plan gifts and um, we have a great plan giving website. It's listed there on the screen. We also, I always like to promote the estate planning kit which is available there. You can download it for free and um, it gives you a record book and a lesson book. The record book is something where you can enter all your different accounts and family members and get it all put in one place. So it's really a great tool to use. And um, if you have trouble finding it, again, you can email me and I will, my email address is right there. You can, um, you know, I'll help you get the link to uh, find where I can send it to you directly. So um, we also, um, that's the next one. 
And um, as I mentioned before, we do really depend on the support of the community to, uh, to support the hospital. We are a nonprofit. And um, so these are just a few different ways of how you can support Torrance Memorial and, um, and, and make sure that uh, strong health care and excellent health care continues to be provided to the community. So we are gonna move now into the presentation. Chris has a lot of great information to share with you. So um, our, our uh, co-chair, Grace St. Clair, I hope is online, and she is going to um, introduce the, uh, our speaker. So we have two co-chairs of our professional advisory council. One is a financial planner, Larry Takahashi, and Grace St. Clair is an estate planning attorney who is um, uh, terming out actually. So we thank Grace for her two years of service as co-chair. And she, I think, is going to come on to online to introduce Chris. <laughs> thank you, Sandy. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone uh, for letting us come into your homes this year. You know, we were hoping to be in person. We're still hoping we're gonna be in person and hope is eternal. So we're going to do it, but in the meantime, Thank you so much for participating. It's very important that we are helping the community through all this information and we wouldn't want to, to miss you all. So thank you so much for helping us be part of this and also to invite your friends and we'll all uh, enjoy the, the seasons next year also. So it's be fitting that I guess that I get to introduce Chris because I served with him as co-chair when he was chairman. So I didn't realize that until today. So welcome please Christian Cordova. Chris Cordoba is a certified financial planner specializing in retirement planning, 401k, and IRA preservation strategies. Chris has been providing financial services since 1989, and in 1997, he started his independent private practice, California Retirement Advisors, which is located in El Segundo. A frequent speaker and contributor to news articles and magazines, Chris also conducts retirement planning courses throughout the South Bay. When he isn't working, he enjoys playing beach volleyball and volunteering to support Bike MS and Torrance Memorial. And with that, I'm going to leave you. I'm going off. My husband's taking me to San Francisco, so I'm so sorry that I'm not going to be able to hear it. But Chris, I'll talk to you later. Thanks again for a great presentation. I know you're going to handle. Nice to see you, Grace Ann. Thank you. And thank you as well, Sandy. And, uh, you know, good afternoon to all of you who are joining us here today. I'm really glad that you can you can join us. Uh, there's a lot to cover today, so I'm going to get right into it with the most uh, important slide that you're eager to see is this disclosure slide. Now, we've read some of them already. You have this in the handout, but uh, it's important just that I mentioned to you. Obviously, we're not providing advice today of any kind and consult with your own uh, financial advisors or tax advisors. Uh, now, you might be wondering a little bit, well, what does Mount Everest have to do with retirement? So I think we can all agree that climbing Mount Everest is no easy feat, right? Uh, in fact, reaching the summit, like retirement itself, is a grand accomplishment by any means, right? But as you're going through that process, any of the training, imagine the years and years of training to get to that point where you finally meet that summit, it, there's a lot of technicalities, a lot of, a, a lot of chances that you need to take as well as you're going through that process. But unfortunately, as grand as that might be to reach the summit, as we well know, there's just a lot of people that don't make it, right? Uh, and as we think about how this relates to retirement, one of the things that we've learned is that as people are reaching the summit at Mount Everest, there are a, a, a lot of them, and oftentimes more, uh, depending on what's, what fact check you look at, the people that don't die on the way up, but in fact die on the way down. Now that might be a bit of a morbid topic to stop uh, to start the project you know, the presentation with today, but I do liken it to the fact that during your working years, your accumulation years, I think of that as your descent, sorry, your ascent, right? And during the distribution years, I like to think of that as the descent. And while making a mistake in retirement isn't likely gonna kill you, it could literally kill some of the chances and opportunities that you have to do some really nice proactive and savvy financial planning if you're not aware of the rules and the technical elements of that. So we don't want that to happen to you in any case or anybody you know. So what we're gonna be doing today is sharing a lot of information that we think can help you 
arm yourself with more knowledge uh, to help you uh, understand how to work within these rules a lot more clearly and benefit to benefit you. So we're going to cover a lot of all items that we want you to know about specific to how to protect your retirement. Uh, in particular, we want you to learn why uh, I'm saying we, I'm just a, accustomed to saying we when I'm working within a group, but today I'm going to be sharing with you information about how to protect your 401k and IRA and specifically why they're uniquely important. Uh, you're going to have, you don't have them yet, but you're going to get afterward a number of different resource charts that we want you to have. And these are things all the way from tax planning to the SECURE Act to Medicare and so forth that even if nothing else from this session, I want you to have these resources to be able to talk with your financial advisor, your tax advisor, or to be able to reference on your own. Now, I know Sandy will send these to you after the presentation is over as a follow-up, but I'll probably reference them as we go through the presentation. Ultimately, I want you to have a better understanding of how to take the money out. That's a key element. It's not just about the ascent, it's the descent. How do you take the money out, both during your lifetime and after you pass away? Uh, ideally, I'd like you to feel like you're more knowledgeable and more confident and that you feel like you're an even better steward of your money for yourself and your family by the time that we're done here today. This is what the agenda looks like. I will tell you that there's a lot of information in you know, classic crisp form, but I knew that you were going to have the handouts and the recordings so you can have the slides to go back to as I bounce around potentially to some of these items. Uh, if you find something that's more important to you, you can ask them at the end or you can also email questions later. Okay, so let's get started with this retirement equation concept. This is a little different way to think about how to plan an ideal retirement. And obviously it doesn't take anything away from the true elements of the core concepts of financial planning, but as we're going through these times of uncertainty like we have today, high inflation, high interest rate, uh, potentially rising taxes on a regular basis, recession, bear markets, there are certain things that you will probably tap into the news, the television, uh, social media to try to get a bearing on what all of that looks like. And it is important, but to a large degree, there are a lot of those things that are outside the scope of your control. And that doesn't mean you shouldn't focus on it, but it can be much more efficient and constructive to focus on those things which you do have control over. And so that's mostly what we're gonna focus on today because things like how much you're saving and how you're taking money out are things that you can control to affect the outcome as far as how likelihood that you'll have a more successful retirement. Things like asset allocation, we're gonna cover in a high level. We know you had an investment course recently, so we're not gonna get granular on that, but just how to think about asset allocation in terms of where you have the money, which we refer to in a little, little bit of a jovial way as asset location, because where you have the money makes a very important, uh, is a very important element of how you take the money out for spending to make sure you're okay, even during times of uncertainty. And a lot of that has to do with looking ahead to see where you are in terms of what your potential spending patterns might be. Now, generally, and especially in California, even though a lot of the journals for many years say that you maybe only really need to leave, live off of 70 or 80% of your working income, but when you retire, you, especially in California, we don't just like to sit on the porch drinking lemonade, growing old gracefully, right? We like to do things. We probably travel more and do more things. We still have things we want to do, whether it's writing a book or, uh, you know, travel and visit the Dodgers at all the stadiums, or uh, maybe you want to be an astronaut. Whatever it is that you want to do, it's probably going to take a little more time and resources. And in California, especially, we have longer longevity. So it's really important to think for a longer period of time and that there'll probably be an area where you're spending more money than even when you were working during these go-go years. Of course, biologically, there'll be a time when we maybe we start slowing down a little bit and then ultimately maybe to a greater extent. But thinking about a declining cash flow during your retirement in advance could be a mistake if you aren't potentially thinking about these other what-if scenarios, including things like healthcare, long-term care expenses, but also rising inflation, higher taxes. These things that we said earlier sometimes are outside the scope of your control, but you can start planning for elements around them based upon what your spending patterns look like. And so I believe that one of the most important things that people can do when you're retiring is start looking at things from a future perspective by running these cash flow and tax projections. If you were here in person, I'd ask for a show of hands, but I would ask this question. 
and I would say, if you owned a business, and maybe you do or have, but if you own a business, don't you think it's a good idea to keep financials of your own business? And I hope you're uh, raising your hand and thinking that you are, but I would ask you then, please think of your own retirement as your own business, and then ask yourself the question, do you have financials for your business to help project out what your finances might look like? Because doing so can help identify certain uh, opportunities and possible threats that could come down the pipeline. And if you knew that there were certain threats that were coming, when would you want to know them? You would want to know them as soon as possible. Isn't that correct? So having somebody look at this with you, if you're not understanding how to do it, or you don't want to do that, you can always delegate that to your advisors. But looking at this can reveal a lot of opportunities over periods of time, not just looking to see what you're spending for the current year. The next item that I'd like to share is in terms of another potential risk that can come into play, even in the midst of looking at your cash flow expenses. And this has to do with your sequence of returns risk. You may or may not be familiar with that term. All it really refers to is the possible risk that might take place if you happen to uh, be looking at a rate of return and you have a top heavy negative rate of return the first few years, uh, but at the latter part of a particular period, you've got a positive greater return and then you flip flop it. So you've got a sequence of returns that might be good in the early years and bad in the latter years or bad in the early years and good uh, in the latter years. So by looking at this while you're saving may, as you can see on the slide here, may not be detrimental while you're saving. This is your ascent, your accumulation years. It will have an impact as you see the purple uh, line here it does decline, but you still live through that okay. But as you're working through your distribution years in retirement and spending during your descent, this could potentially be a significant impact because you don't have control necessarily over what happens during the time that you plant that flag and retire and start your descent, right? If you had, if you had retired, let's just say uh, in 1999, just before Y2K, retired in the midst of going into three back to back to back negative years, negative nine, negative 12, negative 22%. And again, maybe again in 2007, if you retired in 2007, that started a very nasty uh, descent right out of the gate and you have no control over that. And so what do you do to think about what your Everest will look like? How do you plan for this even if you've done a cash flow projection? And one of the things that you could start doing potentially is start thinking of your assets based upon time horizon as far as when you might spend those assets down. And, and a lot of people like to simplify when they retire and maybe consolidate all of their accounts. Maybe you have a 60 40 allocation, but really starting to identify based upon your cash flow projections which dollars you might need in the early years, maybe in the first year or two or three. And then maybe a little bit further down the line, your medium term years and then your longer term years. We often like this, liken this to what we call a bucket plan philosophy. Because once you have those allocations based upon your, your spending needs, now you can, you can come back and say, okay, I know I'm not gonna need those dollars in buckets two or three over the next few years. So even if we were in the midst of COVID, like what took place um, just recently, we were very lucky. We all tend to have very short-term memories, right? But remember how awful it felt when the economy was literally shutting down. And we did not know that the, that the economy and the markets were going to bounce back as fast as they did, especially the markets, because the markets bounced back a lot faster than the economy did. But we did not know in the midst of that 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 would take place. It could have been a lot worse, like those three years that I was mentioning before. If that had been the case, by having enough dollars funded for the next one or two or three years and more conservative assets, you would have been okay. You would have been able to at least have the peace of mind that you wouldn't have to sell assets at depleted prices just because everything was down. Something that we know is going to happen at some point in time for one reason or another. I don't know if you recall, and I don't know how often if I can't see your faces here, but there was, the last time I presented here was in 2019. And at that time, uh, instead of using Mount Everest as the in initial image, I used the Northridge earthquake slides. And the reason that I did that is because I was shedding light that that was the 25th anniversary of the Northridge quake uh, in 1994. And I said, we hadn't had a quake like that for quite some time, luckily, and hopefully we, <laughs> we don't for a lot longer. 
still or if ever. But we also had had a 10 year period where the markets had been climbing from 2009 and hadn't declined yet. And we said, I don't know what the next decline will be for, but I do know that the best time to start planning for that is when the markets are up. <laughs> and unfortunately, like an earthquake, you wanna plan for that before it occurs. Isn't that correct? The bucket plan is how you plan for this in advance. And even though it seems like we might be in a decline right now, it isn't too late because all we really are is back to some of the values that we were as of last year, potentially. And things could get worse. I'm not saying that they will be because we're not focusing on things that are outside the scope of our control today. But just keep in mind that this type of planning structure can be very effective to help protect your retirement. The next element of building that bucket plan then is the asset location. Where do you have your investments? Now, some of these you might have by default because of how you've accumulated these dollars over the years, uh, whether you've saved within your 401k accounts or whether you, have, um, you, you, you didn't have a 401k account, maybe you had your own business and you, built, uh, you, you sold your business and received dollars as, as, a, uh, as a proceed from the sale of that business or real estate. Whatever the case may be, your mix of assets and types of accounts are going to be different than everybody else's. And understanding your tax diversification is critically important because that's going to play an integral role as to how you take the monies out during your descent, during your distribution years. And so getting an understanding of how the taxes work are really important. This slide shares with you different elements of the different tax baskets that I like to share. You see the color code with the green and the taxable withdrawals that are taxed at ordinary income. We'll get more into that today for sure. Um, but something that uh, often gets overlooked is the impact of your taxable accounts that you can see here, because the taxable accounts play an important role if you even have them. A lot of times people end up with top heavy and retirement assets and not enough tax after tax dollars that don't provide you the same flexibility. But if you do have them, it's important to consider how the tax aspects affect the combination of the income that you might be receiving also from your 401ks and IRAs. Um, Roth 401ks and IRAs obviously are really important because they're going to be one of the few areas where you can receive money on a tax-free basis. And we'll get into this more a little bit later. Probably the most underutilized tool is going to be a health savings account. And those have some really good tax-free benefits as well. So just keep these in mind. I'm going to overly simplify these by literally putting them in these baskets now and just share with you a little bit more of the component. So think of the red basket here as anything that you might have accumulated that you've already paid taxes on, but as you continue to earn money in those baskets, they continue to be taxable. These might be dollars that are going to be essentially uh, earned maybe because you own a piece of real estate and you're paying property tax and you're renting out the properties and you're paying tax on the rental income that you're receiving. Obviously there's tax benefits from depreciation and so forth, but it's just an example. You could also have a trust account that's generated income or interest and you have to pay taxes on that, even if you're not using the money. Next, you might have non-deductible tax deferred, the yellow basket. These are things that you essentially have earned like the red basket, but now you're putting them into something else that will be deferred going forward. So you're funding it with after-tax money, but anything that it grows to in the future will be tax deferred. This often is utilized by annuities, a number of different types of deferred annuities, um, and, but non-qualified annuities, not retirement annuities uh, per se. Then what we end up having too much of often is going to be this tax deductible, tax deferred type of accounts. And that's because we all bought into this bit of a myth for many years. And that was to, you know the phrase, you can say it with me possibly, is that defer, defer, defer. And when you retire, you'll retire at a lower tax bracket. You guys remember that phrase? So as you go through, just think about the concept of that. And not to say that it was a bad idea to defer those dollars, but there is a time now as you descent through your Everest to start thinking about how much is enough and how much is too much. And maybe there's not enough money in the tax-free baskets like the Roth IRA or the Roth 401k or the HSA or even life insurance that can be utilized as tax-free baskets or municipal bonds that are taxable on the interest but not necessarily on the capital gains that you might generate from there. So understanding these rules and how they might play out may be very important especially if you're top heavy in that tax deferred basket and you believe that we're going to be in higher tax situations in the future than we are today. 
This is just a quick chart of the history of tax rates at the highest tax marginal, at the highest marginal tax level. You can see here that they, even though it seems like we are always at the highest bracket, they've certainly been a lot higher in the past than they are today. So it's something that's important to consider. They could go up and we know that the government is essentially, has a lot of debt and deficit. It's, it's uh, ridiculous how fast that has been climbing. Uh, and even in just looking at this from the last time I presented, um, it's gone up uh, several trillion dollars. So as you go through, it's important then to identify the fact that even though our tax bracket system at the top rate is 37%, your own effective tax rate may not necessarily be quite that high because you're not taxed on everything based upon the, your last dollar of income all the way back to dollar one. We have this progressive tax system. And it's important to recognize that there are some great tax brackets at the lower level, at 10, 12, even 22 or 24 percent. Those are still gift horse, in my opinion, uh, today. Those are elements that you could take advantage of before things get higher in the future. Now, that's my belief, and, uh, and that's where I will usually uh, disclose before I blur those lines. You have to think about this for yourself, but if nothing else, start at least thinking about the fact that maybe having deferred dollars for many, many years might shed some light as far as how you start unraveling that tax deferral and start getting a good idea as far as how to take advantage of some of these lower brackets in the years that you have them because with IRAs and 401ks in particular, every dollar that comes out is subject to ordinary income taxes. So one of the things I always like to share with people is how would you feel if you had a mortgage on your home and as the value on your home was appreciating, so was the mortgage because your mortgage was attached to the value of the house. And you probably wouldn't be too excited about that, especially with property values here in California, right? In the South Bay, especially. Uh, but if you think about your retirement accounts, that's essentially what's happening. Because even as pretty as it might look on your statement when you see those values climbing, the amount of money that you're going to pay tax on is also climbing along the way. So this is a problem that doesn't go away just because you're doing better. In fact, you potentially may owe more taxes if you do better in your retirement accounts. So while the values are down, especially, might be a good idea to take control of some of the choices that you have to figure out how to take advantage of some of these lower stock prices and maybe pay lower taxes along the way. But the most important thing that you could do here is at least start identifying it because you might be feeling really good and you should about having paid down all of your debt along the way, maybe your home and everything else is paid for. But if you haven't yet identified your retirement accounts and maybe at least put some estimate of what taxes you might have to pay on those at some point in the future, you haven't really paid down all of your tax debt, in my opinion. And so I just like to start explaining that as a concept. So at least you start thinking about it, maybe on your balance sheet, just like we've done here, where we've identified the highlighted accounts that are tax deferred and assigned an approximate 40% tax rate if you were to pull the money out all at one time. Now, obviously we know it's 37% at the highest rate and that doesn't include state, federal. So it's not too far fetched necessarily, but it's also unrealistic that you would probably pull the money out all at one point in time. The point here being is that there is tax debt it has to be paid at some point, and if it isn't paid by you, it's just a can that gets kicked down the road for your beneficiaries. And that leads us to starting to think about how retirement accounts are different in particular, because all of your retirement accounts live by a complete different set of rules than all the other types of accounts that you may own. Uh, and here's the reasons why, uh, just a few of them. Tax deferred retirement accounts like IRAs and so forth are generally taxed at ordinary income tax rates, both during life and after death. I just mentioned that in the last sentence. So other items, for instance, uh, might receive capital gains treatments, favorable treatments. Capital gains tax rates are taxed at a lower rate than ordinary income tax rates. But it doesn't matter whether you have had gains in your retirement accounts or you're getting uh, dividends from qualified uh, dividend uh, uh, paying stocks or so forth within your retirement accounts. The only thing that matters is how much you take out of the account and they're taxed at ordinary income tax rates. And like I said, both during your lifetime and after you pass away. So there's no gain benefits and there's no losses or deductions that you can take. There's also no step up in basis, like if you had left a piece of real estate property to uh, a son or daughter, or if you inherited a piece of real estate property, you might have had the experience that you didn't have to pay for the gain 
that, uh, that took place from the time that the person who was deceased purchased the property to the time that they left it to you. That's one of the biggest benefits in the tax code and it doesn't exist within the retirement accounts. Also, it cannot be transferred to trust during your lifetime. You can't, even if you have the most expensive trust, you can't retitle your retirement account into the name of the trust because to do so would mean you would take it out of the IRA account and pay taxes on the entire account all at one time and essentially wouldn't be an IRA account anymore. So although you need to retitle your other assets, it's important to, make, to understand that you can't do that on your retirement account. So the beneficiary designation form becomes even more important than, uh, than maybe other accounts. So there's many, many more. I just wanted to share an example of how that might work. And for that reason, it's really important to understand the odd nuances that might take place depending on what type of retirement account you may own. For the purpose of this meeting, we just don't have the time to dig deeper into each one of these, but it is important to share with you that each one of them might have a certain set of circumstances that might be different, and more unique to it versus something else. Regardless of where you have your current retirement plan while you're working, you might be subject to some choices that you have once you're no longer working. And this is an area that for many years, I believe people didn't really understand these options. And part of the reason is that oftentimes you go seek advice and the people you're seeking advice from are only getting paid based upon one of these options. And that option would be is rolling the dollars over from a company plan to a retirement plan. And so for many years, people didn't have this. Now, due to new regulatory items, everybody has to disclose this. You might recognize that there's additional paperwork and you go to roll over your accounts and you're working with advisors these days that make sure that they're disclosing these options to you. So I just want to at least make sure you know about these because this could be one of the biggest decisions that you make with one of the largest assets that you may have after having worked 20, 30, 40 years for a particular company. Now, this is a presentation in itself, so I'm just going to at least cover one point on each one. So one of your options might be to leave your assets in your existing plan account. And you might think, well, I'm not working there anymore. Why would I leave it? And it's a good point. And there's a good chance that most of the time you wouldn't. But there could be a time when maybe you need a bridge of dollars from the time that you retired up until the time that you turn on a pension or you turn on Social Security or so forth. And you don't have any other after-tax assets within your, within your inventory of resources. So you may need to tap your retirement accounts. And if you've taken the dollars and you've rolled them over into an IRA account and you are not quite yet age 59 and a half, but you happen to be age 50, so you're between the ages of 50 and 59 and a half, if you leave your assets behind at a company plan, you have the ability to take those dollars out without paying the too soon penalty that would otherwise be affected within the IRA account. That too soon penalty is a 10% uh, cost a 10% penalty. So it gives you some flexibility to say, I'm going to tap into that account without having to worry about that 10% so that I know I have enough money without having to uh, uh, pay the 10% and I'll build a bridge until I can start turning income on from other sources. So that might be an example. You might also roll over dollars to uh, another, another company plan. Maybe you left one employer and went to work at another one. Now that could create all kinds of additional considerations uh, as far as why you would do that. But maybe for starters, maybe uh, either yourself or your spouse is a physician or here at Torrance Memorial, maybe they're a physician or they're an attorney or somewhere that might be uh, a little bit more liable to additional uh, lawsuits. And so for creditor protections, maybe it makes more sense for you to have dollars inside of a retirement account. Now with that, there could be many other considerations as to why you wouldn't do this. So uh, please don't get me wrong. I'm just saying there could be an option to do that. Uh, another reason to keep dollars inside of a retirement plan, by the way, is if you for any reason want to extend your required minimum distributions to be on age 72 and you're still working. So if you're still working, you have the still working exception where you don't have to take the dollars out of a retirement plan as long as you're still working. Uh, and you're not more than a 5% owner of that company. So if you have your own company, it doesn't quite work the same. Rolling over assets to your own IRA account is oftentimes going to be the most flexible, give you the most choices, both in choices of investments, uh, maybe the advice that you're getting pertaining to those accounts. Uh, but uh, it isn't going to be an all or nothing uh, decision. Uh, taking a lump sum distribution might seem a little odd, but the reason you might do this is if you happen to be working for an employer that has company stock within that company plan. 
So uh, it, there's some special tax rules that allow you, my office is across the street from Boeing, for instance, so anybody that owns Boeing stock can take the dollars out of that, that Boeing stock out of that company plan, potentially uh, at a lower tax rate than just paying regular ordinary tax rates. So that's something that you want to know about if you own company stock within your plan. Converting to uh, a plan within your own retirement account is really an option to, to possibly uh, uh, start getting out of the tax deferred area and start putting dollars in tax free. That might be something that you let your employer know about. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, that was, that was number six. So number five is to convert your plan assets to a Roth IRA. And that is also something we're going to share with you a little bit more, but that would be for the main reason of starting to get and unravel the amount of tax debt that you have inside of that company plan and gives you some more flexibility in the future in terms of taking monies out of that company plan on a tax-free basis, out of the IRA, excuse me. There is now, a, 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 this is not a, one of the six options coming out of a company plan, but we just did a little play here on another potential rollover option. And this would be from an IRA account because we are at Torrance Memorial here and uh, supporting this uh, beautiful organization, of course. But regardless of whether it's uh, Torrance Memorial or anybody else, you do have the ability to take monies directly from your IRA account and move it to a charitable organization via a QCD. Uh, qualified charitable distribution. And you see the rules here pertaining to that. Uh, I know a lot of you are very well versed in this already because you've already done this, and so we thank you for that, absolutely. Um, but I just want to mention that even though the required minimum distribution age has gone up to 72, you can still do this at age 70 and a half. That is not a typo. You can still do this with, uh, with IRA assets if you've reached 70 and a half and, and up from there. So you have a cap of $100,000. And the point that uh, I want to shed a little light on here is this fourth bullet, which says the transfers, priorities, deferred taxes, in, uh, transfer prioritizes deferred taxable income first. This is interesting because if you have a combination of tax deferred uh, assets and after tax assets within your retirement accounts, you're normally subject to a pro rata rule where every distribution uh, is part taxable and part de deferred assets. But this is an exception to the rule. So if you're contributing money from uh, a company plan and you have a mix of both of those asset types, you can do it via QCD and your tax deferred assets will be contributed, but your after tax assets will stay behind. And that might give you an additional benefit to utilize those dollars later for your own spending. But let's take a little deeper dive into this as an, as an example. Here we have Albert and Shirley, they're 71. They're in a 24% bracket. They give 5,000 to charity. Um, and they have $15,000 in existing itemized deductions. They're subject to the standard deduction and they want to make a $5,000 donation. There's no federal benefit, uh, tax benefit there because they're still not quite, uh, it's not enough here to uh, exceed the, the, the standard deduction that they have. But here's how it would work if they did not take advantage of the QCD. They would essentially take money out of their IRA account, put it into their checking account, and then give that money to charity. So once it hits their checking account or it comes out of the IRA account, that now gets added to their taxable income for the year. And this is what the numbers look like. So they, uh, they want to give the 2000, uh, sorry, in this case, we use Torrance Memorial as an example. How about that? We want to assume that they're getting the full $5,000. Now, if they were at RMD age, which they not, they're not in this example, but we wanted to put this in here to let you know that if they were at RMD age, this would satisfy the RMD. So if the RMD for the year was going to be $10,000 and they contributed $5,000, now they only need to take out another $5,000 out of the retirement accounts. But $5,000 is reported as taxable income, and you see the tax bill on the distribution here at the 24% bracket would be $1,200. So the total cost to contribute $5,000 was actually $6,200. So we want to save you money, right? Especially when you're contributing to Torrance Memorial. So instead, what you want to do is take that money directly from the IRA, go directly into the charity. Again, we'll use Torrance Memorial as the example. But look at the difference in the savings. So here, what you're noticing is there's no dollars in terms of a tax bill. You have instead a $1,200 savings that you would have otherwise paid to taxes. And the net numbers are quite going to be quite a bit better. So uh, it also doesn't trigger additional taxable circumstances by hitting your tax return that are not even on the slide. So a QCD is going to be a great way to do it. It's one way to start spending the dollars down first. Now, it, going into the next section here, again, climbing uh, the ascent, coming down, 
sorry, the descent coming down from Mount Everest, you might now be at the point in your life and you're trying to figure out, okay, how do I spend money out of my accounts? Which assets do I spend down first? It's one of the most overlooked elements of the whole retirement planning process because very few people get paid to give you advice on how to take money out of your account. If you think about your own investment accounts, when was the last time one of your investment companies called you and said, by the way, if you were wondering, this is a good time to take your money out for tax reasons. Now, some of your advisors might do that, but the investment companies generally don't do that itself. And this is an example. We're going to look at Sam and Mary. They want to spend about $8,500 a month, but they want to see where the monies might come from. And so where you take your monies from in what order can make a big difference. And the conventional wisdom on this is that spending taxable money first uh, would work, and then you spend the tax deferred money, and then you spend the tax free money. And the reason people do this is because the reward that you get today. By spending the taxable money first, you don't pay any taxes generally because you're not taking money out of your retirement accounts and therefore there's no additional tax consequence to you. But there's potential problems with this conventional wisdom. And the first is that you, by taking out all of your taxable income first, you're essentially cannibalizing your after-tax money, leaving only taxable income sources to draw from in conjunction with other potential taxable income that you may have, social security, pensions, or what have you. Um, obviously, you can't de defer the taxes forever, and the taxes may, may be higher in the future as well. So this may or may not work uh, for you, but it's something that you definitely want to think about as you're going through this. So what's an alternative approach? Well, partially would be to still keep that concept of spending the taxable money first, but don't cannibalize it. You don't have to spend it all. You could take a blended amount of that taxable amount and some money from your retirement accounts, take advantage of those lower tax rates during your distribution years, and possibly, or at the same time, convert some of your IRA dollars into Roth IRAs during low tax years, maybe even during low market years like we have today. Then you could spend those tax deferred monies after those dollars are spent down, and then until depletion, and then, and only then, spend your after-tax monies later, sorry, your tax exempt dollars later. So this is an interesting thought to consider, but the distribution approach, the distribution strategy is going to be potentially different for everybody depending on what your asset location is, what type of accounts do you have, which we shared with you earlier on. Ultimately, however, a smart strategy might look something like this at the latter part of your retirement. Why? Because at this point, you're not subject to whatever mercy the Uncle Sam's tax rates might be at, at the most important part of your retirement where you might actually need additional dollars in unforeseen amounts for healthcare expenses or potentially um, rising inflation or whatever the case may be. And think of it this way. Wouldn't it be nice to know that at the latter part of your retirement, if you go and you pull dollars out of an ATM, you pull out $100 and you get $100? Right now, we don't know how much you're going to get out of that ATM in the future. So start thinking about possibly how to move more dollars into tax freeze. So this, this begs the question, should I convert the dollars to a Roth IRA? This is not a new concept. I realize that more and more people are starting to do this and good for you. It's not something that I believe everybody should emphatically do, but I at least want everybody to be aware of it. And just like a good consumer for anything that you might be purchasing, don't let somebody tell you just to defer your dollars until you no longer have to pay the taxes, or as long as you can to pay the taxes, without knowing the cost of what it might cost you to take the dollars out and start making some conversions. If you're a good consumer, you should know those costs, just like you do with everything else. And here are some items, I'm not gonna read through all, all of them, but you can see here that there's a number of considerations that you might wanna think about to determine whether this might be right for you. Ultimately, the, one of the main benefits of Roth IRAs is that they have no required minimum distribution. So you maintain control, and a lot of retirement is about maintaining freedom and flexibility and control uh, of what you do with your money. And not having to take the required distributions allows you to have the compounding on a tax-free basis for a longer period of time and possibly leave tax-free dollars to your beneficiaries as well. So coming back to the tax bracket system, remember to start thinking about where you are in terms of your current tax situation. This is the great time of year to be looking at your taxes, by the way. I know people look at it after the start of the year, but by looking after the start of the year, most people are essentially just score keeping from what happened the prior year. Your tax advisor is probably a little bit less busy today than they are in the middle of tax season in March or April although I know there's other tax uh, uh, reasons why they'll be meeting with clients right now. However, 
you might have their ear a little bit better with a little bit more focused attention if you start having them review how you could reduce your taxes today that can help you for 2022 and maximize your lower brackets and whether or not a Roth conversion strategy might be a good idea for you or not. Now, there are side effects of doing conversions and I wouldn't be um, doing my job properly here today if I didn't make you aware of these. Things like increasing the Medicare Part B premiums is one that's kind of the stealth tax that comes into play if you aren't aware of how much you're converting and staying within limits that may or may not uh, affect you in that way. One that uh, I haven't actually seen on any presentation, so I've added it here, is the importance of making sure that you've accounted for adjusting for quarterly estimated tax payments for the year, because this could result in a penalty if this hasn't been thought of. So remember, as the distributions come out, that it will affect your income and you could potentially owe additional dollars uh, for estimated taxes. So there could be other benefits though, especially to the spouse that get overlooked as well. In particular, think about this. So if you've done a conversion, now the surviving spouse after you've passed away is no longer gonna be subject to making required distributions that they may have otherwise have had to take. And if you're about the same age, they probably would have had to have taken about the same amount as you did. And so their income stays the same, possibly the same as when you were filing your taxes jointly, but now they're filing taxes single. And there could be additional ramifications where they're paying more percentage at a higher tax rate for the same amount of income that you were getting while you were living. We call this the widow's penalty or the widower's penalty. So really important to see in how that might work. It also, by no, taking no additional distributions uh, out of the IRA and instead from the Roth IRA, it won't affect Medicare Part B. So there's a big benefit of thinking how you could protect your spouse, not just how much taxes am I gonna pay today? So the question is, should you continue to defer your IRA distributions? It might you know, a a allow you some benefits, especially this triple tax deferred compounding, which has been beautiful, is possibly the reason why you have so much accumulated in the accounts anyhow. But unfortunately, you can't defer forever, <laughs> right? So this is where we start thinking about, okay, government uh, made us a deal. That deal was that I get the deferral when you put the monies in. Now think about that for a minute. They did nothing else. You've done everything since then. You got that deduction on the way in, but you've paid the investment costs. You've taken the time to manage your accounts. You've received the growth in the accounts. And now as you take the monies out, they get the benefits from the higher tax rates. But they tell you that even as good of a deal as that is for them, they now want to get paid. And that, that, that pay date is gonna be age 72 uh, for IRAs and also for most plans, unless you're still working. Like I said, you might be able to get the still working exception. Now, this is an area where uh, it, it can, uh, there's been standard rules on this for quite some time now, but there's also a lot of things happening right now, which I'll get into in just a moment. But first, let's look at the basics. Here's how it works. First, you've got, uh, you wanna start with the year which you turn age 72. And by the way, if you're not age 72 yet, please don't check out because first of all, you shouldn't be waiting until you're 72 to start looking at this. You may have this beautiful runway of opportunity from ages 59 and a half to 72 where you're in a lower tax rate and you can start reducing your amounts that you have in your IRA accounts by doing conversions so that you won't even have to deal with RMDs when we get here. But we also have more coming up for you that will affect you even if you're under age 72. But if you are here, you know how this works likely or you might need to start thinking about this now as you're gonna divide the prior year's ending account uh, by the remaining life expectancy. So you're gonna look at December 31st valuations. Uh, and in this case, let's say a $500,000 example uh, is divided by 27.4 and, and you see it's 18.28. Now, something that's just changed recently is going to be this RMD chart. You may have had this RMD chart uh, and maybe it's at your desk or something, but if you don't have the one for 2022, it's now outdated. And the reason why is, as you know, they changed the required minimum distribution age from 70 and a half to 72. And at that time, they just kept the old chart that they had um, and they started using the divisor or the percentage as of age 72 that was on the old chart. And this is the old one, this is what it looks like. So you can scrap this one. I just wanna make sure you have the right one. The new one, what it's done is it's taken the same divisor, let me go back, it's taken the same divisor that was at age 70 and a half, and it's added it 
as the divisor for age 72. So before you had to take 3.65% out of your retirement account starting age 75. But if I go back to the old chart for a second, you see that the first RMD amount at age 72 is 3.91%. That's more that you're being forced to take out of your account and pay taxes on. But now it's been adjusted to, the, the, to match what used to be the amount at age 70 and a half. I hope that makes sense. Now, this might be a little small to read here, and I also want you to have this as for, for a future reference on your desk. So like I said, Sandy's gonna have this new up-to-date RMD chart sent to you along with several other charts that you'll be able to have at your disposal. Okay, so let's talk about RMDs in general. A uh, few considerations. Some of these are uh, considered and some of these are often overlooked. So do you take them early or late in the year? It's a good question. And there's no hard and fast rule on this, but it is worth considering that what I'd like to share with people is if you've come off a really good year like 2021, it may not be a bad idea to take it early in the year in a lump sum. And the reason why, and I've been saying this for years, by the way, it just happens to be that we're living the example. If you've got a double digit, maybe a 10, 15, 20% return last year, and you have to take out three, uh, four or 5%, you could take that money in January from profits that you didn't have just a year ago. Maybe you didn't even have it a few months ago, but that profit may not live there forever. Like we're seeing now, what happened? The markets came right back down. So it is important to consider when you do this and being strategic and having at least discussions about this. Do you have automated RMDs established on each IRA account? This is the easy way to do it, but it is still worth reviewing on, at least on an annual basis, to see how that might affect you. And part of the reason for it is there might be certain accounts that you want to pull the money out of instead of a different. If you have multiple IRAs, you can aggregate the amount that you pull out of one IRA versus the other. So if you have uh, five different IRA accounts and you've got $10,000 of RMDs that have to come from each one, you could pull $50,000 out of one of the accounts instead of pulling it um, 10,000 out of each one. And if you have all of your accounts that are down in value, except for one of them that is up $50,000, maybe you're able to sell from those profits and not sell from the losses. Another reason for this, if you think back at 2020, what happened? After COVID, they said that we don't have to take RMDs. But if you had automatic RMDs taking place, it's possible that you kept taking distributions and now you pay taxes on money that you didn't actually need to take in the first place. So are you selling specific investments or proportionately across your accounts? I just mentioned that, that's the aggregation rule. You can be specific as far as where you're strategically wanting to take your dollars out. And if you wanna get more granular, which investments are you selling within the accounts? If you have just a traditional 60, 40 allocation strategy, even if 60% is up, but 40% is down, you're still selling 40% of your assets while they're down in value, violating the one golden rule, buy low, sell high, right? So looking to see and maybe having different sets of accounts, short, medium, long-term, like we were talking about before, allows you to have the ability to take dollars out of certain accounts in a very strategic manner as you're descending with your own Mount Everest, figuratively. Some of the mistakes that take place is um, people aggregate RMGs between IRAs and different types of retirement plans. So for instance, if you have uh, two 401k plans and, and two IRA accounts, you still have to take at least three RMDs because you can aggregate the two IRA accounts, but each 401k still has to take their own respective required minimum distribution. Don't make that mistake. It's a 50% penalty as we saw earlier. Uh, you also cannot aggregate between spouses. Please make sure you take your own account. And if you have an inherited IRA, which we'll be speaking about more so in a, in a few minutes here, it's important to understand that you cannot aggregate, even though it's your inherited IRA, you can't aggregate the RMD amount with your own regular IRA. So please don't do that. Okay, so are we having fun yet? I'm just gonna pause here for a minute. I hope you guys are. I can't see your smiling faces, but I'm having fun. So I, I hope this is, uh, this is being helpful for you. But we're about to open up this can of worms right here, and I wanna share with you what's happening with you, just for your own knowledge. Now, please don't panic on this, and if this is a little bit too technical, uh, you'll have the slides, you can ask questions, but most importantly, speak to your own advisors about some of these items, because what happens after the IRA owner dies is something that is in the midst of change right now. In fact, there's been new guidance on this that's taken place as of February of this year. And so this guidance is something that your advisors might be referring to, and if they aren't, that's okay. But I'm gonna read a little bit about one of my tax resources that I lean upon or shared with me. Uh, and that's gonna be that these proposed 
regulations. Essentially, this provides some clarity to the SECURE Act rules that took place earlier, or December 31st of 2019, and implemented as of 2020. So those came out, those have been working, I'm gonna share with you what those look like. But now, there's been some clarification on rules as of February of this year to those SECURE Act rules. And these are proposed regulations. Now, proposed regulations are different than proposed legislation. So you might be thinking it's proposed, it's not final, well, why discuss it? And it's because they're different. Proposed legislation is not effective until it is passed by Congress and signed into law by the President. But proposed regulations are different. When the IRS puts them out, we can rely upon them immediately. Of course, there will be a hearing, and then eventually the IRS will issue the final regulations, and that sometimes takes a while. But check with your own advisors is really important here. See which, what, they're, what they're referring to in terms of the guidance, but this is the current IRS guidance. So we wanna make sure that we at least introduce this to you. Okay, so where does this begin? First of all, let's start with who gets the Cadillac of options if somebody passes away. If you're married, the spouse gets all of the same choices that they've had in the past, and there's three. Here you see them. And again, I'm talking about uh, dollars that are coming from, let's just say IRA, retirement accounts, but let's say IRAs specifically here. And in this case, what you see is that the surviving spouse has the ability to either maintain the deceased owner's account and set up an inherited IRA. Um, and there's certain reasons you would do that is to tap into the age of the surviving spouse for RMD purposes. But that's now become a little bit more convoluted now as well. Uh, a simple example on that is when uh, I remember there was one of our clients who passed away. Uh, uh, she was five years. Um, she was five years younger than the husband. And so by keeping it into her name, we were able to keep the RMDs off of the books without having to have him pay additional taxes for five years. Uh, now seven years because the RMD age was extended. Funny enough, the little side story is that uh, I went with them to a local attorney and they were telling them that they could not set up an inherited IRA. I didn't argue with them because I respected the fact that I was in their office. Um, but it was fun to know that we were right about that. We fact checked that with their tax advisor and they've been deferring those taxes. And he's been, instead of taking RMDs, doing conversions now for the last six years. So that's the sort of thing that I mean is you want to look and see what your choices are. Uh, so the other thing to consider is they could treat it as their own, take the own, uh, the, the, wherever the assets were left and just convert it into their own IRA account or they can move it into their own separate IRA account. The spouse is the only one that can do this. Okay, so just remember that, we'll come back to this. Then we've got these SECURE Act changes. These are the ones that came through as of December 31st, 2019. And these cause these major changes. And this is where Congress basically said enough is enough because what we used to do as advisors is talk about the stretch IRA rules that you may remember. And this is where we were able to allow a uh, IRA owner to leave monies maybe to their youngest grand, their youngest you know, beneficiaries, which are often their grandkids, and allow them to stretch the dollars out for many years. I mean, sometimes 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years. But these accounts were never designed for state purposes. We were just taking advantage of the rules as we always try to do. But they provided clarity because the government is broke. <laughs> No, partially, right? The, the, there's a lot of debt. They want to start getting paid, and they said enough is enough. And so now they said, look, you, you cannot do the stretch anymore in most cases. You still have to take the dollars out, but you don't have to take the dollars out on an annual basis. You have a full 10 years to be able to take the dollars out. And this was the first version of the SECURE Act uh, 1.0 that we see here, which is going to be the 10-year RMD. This basically said that you have one RMD, and that's at the end of the 10th year. So as somebody received an inheritance, they didn't need to take the dollars uh, generally, and they would be able to, um, but, they would be, but they could, and then they would be forced to take the distributions at the end of the 10th year. Now, we haven't had this long enough for anybody to have been forced to take that yet, but this is how the rules worked. There were exceptions to the rules, and this is where a lot of people were saying that the stretch IRA is dead was wrong. It wasn't dead. It was just dead for most people. But there were still these five categories of people that it wasn't dead for. One of them was the spouse. We've already mentioned that. The others were uh, somebody disabled, chronically ill, individuals not more than 10 years younger than an IRA owner. Now that wording is a little bit interesting if you look at it carefully. It says individuals not more than 10 years younger. But that also means individuals that were older. 
And so just keep that in mind. This is really designed so you could leave dollars to possibly a sibling or something like that that's about the same age. I guess Congress thought, well, you know, how much longer are they going to live? They'll, they'll probably take it out about as fast as they can anyway. And then minor children, not specified here, and I think uh, we'll add that next time, is this has to be minor children of the deceased IRA owner, not just any minor children. Um, and this has been changed just recently as of February of this year because this was left up to the states as, as of the age of majority. But now this is until they reach the age of 21 across the board. So that's been clarified as well. And then there's this other unwritten grandfathered exception for designated beneficiaries who inherited before 2020. So this is all of us that were actually implementing the stretch IRAs as we knew that we could for many, many years. As long as somebody passed away and implemented that prior to, um, to 2020, so December, uh, January 1st of 2020, uh, sorry, December 31st of 2019, uh, 2019 or sooner, would have been able to grandfather the, the stretch IRA. And that still continues. You still have the ability to do that. So don't worry if that's the case. But let's look at this a little closer. First of all, there's three parts that I think of that you could think of how to utilize these rules. One is to determine if the deceased IRA owner was subject to RMDs as the year of the death. This is completely different, and I'll share with you why that's important in a minute. But first, just determine if the deceased IRA owner was subject to RMDs as of the year of death or not. If so, be sure that the total RMD was taken out. Okay, so remember, if somebody passed away, they had to take RMDs while they were living because they were over age 70 and a half. You have to look to see whether they've already taken that out or not. And if they haven't, be sure that that money is taken out, ideally by December 31st, but now the new clarification said that, look, that might have been challenging for somebody who died on December 20th and you had to take the monies out by December 31st. So now you have until the tax filing deadline of the following year. So that's, uh, that's a little bit helpful there as well. Okay, so you've got that. Now part two then is going to be to determine if multiple beneficiaries exist inside of the account. And if they do, you want to split those accounts by December 31st of the year following the year of death. And the reason for that is so that each one could potentially utilize their own life expectancy and how to utilize the stretch IRAs or when their 10 year period will start and so, so on. But there's other things that need to be done. I just didn't put them in, but if, you, if it's a trust for any reason, you wanna make sure that the trust gets reported to uh, the custodian by September 30th uh, and uh, yeah, so September and December 31st is, uh, is gonna be really important to make sure that the accounts are split. And again, if there's a trust, that that trust gets reported to your custodian. So please don't forget that. It's, it's a really important if you have a trust that allows um, that to take place, to be able to look through the trust and see the, the ages of the beneficiaries. That was a little bit into the weeds. Sorry about that. I just uh, went a little bit rogue. Uh, okay, so, but it's important. I can answer more questions on that later. Determine the type of the beneficiary or beneficiaries here. And now this is where it's different. Before any beneficiary was basically considered a primary or a secondary beneficiary. And that's still the case on your beneficiary designation form. But now the IRS considers these three different categories of beneficiaries for the purpose of determining how much or how fast you have to continue to take out required distributions. And here's what they look like. They're gonna be these non-designated beneficiaries. Now the non-designated beneficiaries is essentially anybody who is not a living, breathing person. Uh, maybe left dollars to a trust, um, a charity, or possibly um, you didn't fill out the beneficiary form. So it just was left to your estate. A non-eligible designated beneficiary is going to be anybody who was not an eligible beneficiary. We covered those already. Remember those five categories. It was a spouse and so on. There are a few slides earlier. But it's, so if anybody that doesn't fit in that box is gonna be a non-eligible designated beneficiary. And then you've got, and this basically could be any other sibling or anybody you wanna leave money to, but is not an eligible designated. There's a lot of acronyms here, and I know it's a little confusing, but remember, this is intended to be an introduction. And I'll show you where all this comes together in a moment. All right, so now you've got those three types of beneficiaries. And by the way, Though that information will also be on the handouts on a gold chart that I'm going to share with you. They've got the definitions of those uh, types of beneficiaries and who's considered uh, to be part of those beneficiary types. But here's what's happened is in the midst of determining how much money has to come out, they brought back this old rule 
because we were happy with people not having to take the dollars out for at least 10 years. That was reasonably simple. But when they provided clarification on this, essentially what they did is they came back and they brought back this old rule, which is referred to the, as the at least as rapidly rule. And at least as rapidly rule means that when somebody receives an inherited uh, IRA account is they now have to take distributions for themselves at least as rapidly as a deceased account owner was taking them when they were living. So <laughs> this is a mess. Um, because it makes it a lot more complex. And this is where the 275 pages of uh, new regs come into play, but this is just gonna be a bit of a summary on a summary chart. So here it's at least as rapidly as the required uh, per the type of beneficiary. This is where these acronyms come into play. And depending on if the deceased IRA owner was already taking RMDs or not. That's why these are three steps, part one, part two, part three, so that you can sort of do it in order. Okay, now here's the behemoth of all charts for today. But uh, it's important that you have this because this will be your reference chart that you can go back to with your advisor or anybody if you happen to be in the situation where you've received an inherited IRA account. And you see on the left-hand side, everything I was just referring to in terms of those acronyms. So first of all, what type of beneficiary is it? Remember the non-eligible, uh, let's start with one in the middle. The eligible designated beneficiary, remember were those five types of categories. This was the spouse, the, dis the disabled, the minor children up to age 21, uh, and then uh, individuals not more than 10 years younger. So if you fall in that category, uh, then you, the stretch still applies. You can actually still do the stretch. It's never been dead. It was just miscommunicated. But this stretch still applies, and, and you could see that here. But you also have the choice of taking out the money using the 10-year rule as indicated above in the, in the box above that. So if you want to, you don't have to uh, take the stretch. You could elect instead just to take out and say, I just want to take out my RMDs uh, I don't want to take out any RMDs and I just want to take it after the end of the 10th year. So if you glow, but that's, you see the columns on the right are now going to be if the owner dies before the RBD date, the RBD, this is the required beginning date. Now the RBD has become a really big deal. So that's another acronym you could throw in there. Um, and on the column on the right is if the account owner dies after the required beginning date. This is where you now have to go in and look to see what happened uh, what was happening to the IRA owner when they passed away, whether they had already started our, uh, RMDs or not. And so this is where if there was an eligible designated beneficiary, in this case, you see that even if they're, um, even though they were eligible, but if the IRA owner had already turned on their re uh, required minimum distributions, now the eligible designated beneficiary has to take out required minimum distributions using the single life expectancy table. So there are, will be RMDs that will be required during this time frame. Non-eligible designated beneficiaries are essentially everybody else, except for people that are not living, breathing people, which are the non-designated beneficiaries on the bottom. So I know this is a little bit confusing, but most important, I want you to understand that this is an area that you want to start considering on if you're receiving an inheritance of IRA accounts to be sure that you've at least explored this to make sure that uh, you're utilizing the right required distribution. Because even though the 10 year rule still applies, there could be a situation where you still have to take required minimum distributions during that 10 year period. Now, here's how it would work for a non spouse beneficiary you would utilize uh, the single life table. Now this is different than the uniform life table that you use for a required uh, uh, minimum distribution during your lifetime. And, um, and, and you'll have that in the handout. You've got a little one here, just partial, but you have it in the handout. So you obtain your accounts prior to the year end balance. You look up uh, the attained age in the year after the IRA account, uh, account owners uh, was deceased on the table to get the factors. And then the difference between here and the uniform distribution table when you were living is that you don't go back to the table every single year. You just go back to it the first year and then every year from there you subtract one. Please speak to your advisors and your consultants on this. It's just important for you to know about. The RMD for inherited Roth IRAs is gonna be different. This is gonna be uh, the same life expectancy table, the single life expectancy table, but they have a little bit more flexibility. Remember, the surviving spouse has all of the choices, so they don't have to take RMDs because they can roll it over into their own account. 
an eligible or EDB can stretch the distributions using the single life expectancy table that you have here, but at least it'll be tax free. And the non eligible designated beneficiaries will be subject to the 10 year rule. Uh, so those that are subject to the 10 year rule, this is the chart that they would use. You will have this in the handouts, like I mentioned. All right, so <laughs> that was a mouthful and it's honestly the first time that I've communicated this. I put these slides together for you, first time ever. Uh, I know it was probably uh, a, a little tricky to go through. Point is that you have the slide and you could speak to your consultants about this in the future um, and or email if you have any questions on those sort of items. So just to wrap things up, the summary action plan and what I'm hoping you take out of today is that there's really no substitute for having a comprehensive retirement distribution plan. Please, if you don't have an action plan to do so yet, you don't have financials, create them. Do them yourself, there's softwares, tech, or uh, work with somebody to help you do this and see what you don't see by looking out at projections. Consider building a customized bucket plan based upon your income needs and leveraging tax diversification of your assets to your advantage. Review the new Secure Act changes. There may be more reason than ever to consider converting to an IRA. So what I mean by this is, look, you might have been apprehensive to make a conversion to a Roth IRA before because of the taxes, but now another factor to consider is, do you really want to put your beneficiaries through the myriad of rules and choices to try to figure out how to take these distributions after you pass away. You might, actually, I don't know. It depends on how much of a sense of humor you have with your family. So, um, okay, so questions to then to ask your advisors are, should I leave your employer plan in your existing company, uh, in your existing company or not? There might be times when that would be uh, uh, of benefit to you. Do you have a plan to reduce the tax issues on your IRA or 401k or other retirement accounts? Um, should I begin doing Roth IRA conversions now for yourself, for your family? Remember that beautiful runway of opportunity between ages of 59 and a half to 70 and a half. How should I structure retirement distribution, your retirement distribution plan? Do you have a plan to distribute, to dissent from your own Mount Everest? And have I reviewed my beneficiary designation forms lately? How will I strategically take RMDs to help preserve your assets? And how will the SECURE Act changes impact the RMDs to your beneficiaries? Probably the most important here is if you do receive an inheritance, is just to remember, if you don't know the rules, touch nothing immediately. At least seek help, uh, talk to your tax advisor, talk to your financial advisor, and get assistance on these items. Coming back to your Everest, the idea here is with your own retirement plan, we want you to be able to live to, another, to see another day. We want your assets to be healthy, to be able to provide you the lifestyle, the confidence, the peace of mind, and the security for not only for yourself, but for your family. Understanding the rules and regulations on the descent, not just the ascent, is a good way to help make sure that happens. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. I told you he had a lot of great information to share, and he certainly did pack a lot into that hour. So. Um, I know you're all giving him a round of applause and we do have um, a couple questions so we'll go back to that and, and look at that but I want to um, I want to mention too that you know Chris talked a lot about those inherited RAs and I always like to uh, mention that a charity Torrance Memorial can be listed as a beneficiary Charity, we don't have to pay taxes on those um, on those inherited uh, IRAs, and when we're the the beneficiary. So, you you know, think about other assets to leave to your children, and don't burden them with their with that tax with those taxes that will be due. And uh, consider including Torrance Memorial as a uh, beneficiary of your IRAs. So we did get a few questions here. Um, the screen is a little bit too big for the little monitor I have. I don't know if you can do something about that back there, um, but I will try to uh, read, read these questions here, even though they're cut off a little bit. Um, so I'm gonna read the question for, um, for Chris to, to respond. Is it possible to combine a charitable required distribution? I can't read it, so. Mitchell, can you read it from the back? It's cutting off the, I, I have, for those online, I have this little monitor thing here on the podium. 
that looks like this and they're they're feeding in the uh, information from the back but I can't it's cutting off on the edges and so I can't read the full question. So while they play around with that in the back, um, we'll, uh, I, I, I don't know, we'll just have to <laughs> hang on. Are there any other quick comments you wanted to make, Chris? Uh, well, no, in, in terms of, uh, I think they were going to, in that question, to combine charitable distributions with something, but I'm not, I'm not sure what that would be. So we'll okay, just, we'll just all right, on. here, they, thank you. They fixed the margins a little bit. So is it possible to combine a charitable required distribution from my IRA with setting up an annuity with Torrance Memorial Hospital, which gives distributions tax-free? That's probably thinking about using the charitable IRA, to, the QCD to set up a charitable gift annuity. Oh, that's an interesting, um, that's an interesting thought. So yeah, so you've got the, the, the charitable remainder trust, uh, that's one of the options through Torrance Memorial, and then you've got the QCD. Um, I think the answer there, to there, that is no, yeah, actually. Yeah, there, there wouldn't be a, a reason to do that because you just want to gift the, the dollars directly to the, to the charitable organization, not pay the taxes on it. Um, you'd probably be better versed to take after-tax dollars to utilize for the charitable remainder trust because there'll be some additional benefits to that you get along with those dollars. So um, I agree with you. I would yeah. say that no, you cannot do that as far as I know, but there really wouldn't be a benefit to doing that either. Yeah, as far as I understand it, the IRS says no to that using your QCD for a gift annuity, a charitable gift annuity or a There, there trust. can be, and maybe where this is where the questions stem from, but there, there was some thought on very large IRA accounts, one workaround to the stretch IRA before these new proposed regs just came out in February would have been to leave the IRA account to, a, to a, a charitable remainder trust like Torrance Memorial. And that would have been a workaround to setting up the stretch IRA for somebody who's a non-eligible designated beneficiary. So basically it was a workaround to do the stretch IRA for, um, for anybody who had a large retirement account. So maybe that's where it stemmed from, but I don't see any other reason why you would do that. Okay, the second question. I am 56 years as of today, birth year 1964, widow of my late husband who was 61 years of age, birth year 1959, when he passed away in December of 2020. His 401k account was transferred in my name and I kept the account with his company and did not take out any funds or distributed it until today as I am unemployed. My Question is, when do I have to start withdrawing the funds? Is it on my late husband who would have been 70 in 2029 or when I become 70 in 2036? That's a well-written question. And first of all, obviously, I'm sorry for your loss in the circumstance for the question. Um, it sounds, if I'm hearing it correctly, that that all took place prior to December 31st of, uh, what year was it? Was it 2020 or 2019? He died in December of 2020. Of, of December of 2020. Okay, so that was after um, the new SECURE Act rules had taken place. But because you're the spouse, remember, the spouse gets the benefit, the best of all the benefits. And by putting it into your name, uh, now you won't generally have to take required distributions until you get to age 72. Does that... I think yeah. that, 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 will, that should answer that question. If there are additional follow-ups on that, please let me know. So yes, um, anytime you've taken the account, because the spouse has the ability to put the IRA account into your own name, and that becomes as if though it's been your account all along. And so you now going forward, just it's actually quite simple. You just have to see when the RMD, uh, what the RBD, the required beginning date will be. And if that changes from now until the time that you get to age 72, um, or uh, till uh, that age, then th that might work a little differently for you. But it yeah. is a 401k account, not an IRA, is what's listed. Does that make any difference? Ah, okay. Well, it depends if when you have taken out the account and took possession of it, whether that was whether it stayed within the IRA or they paid it out. I'm sorry, whether it stayed within the 401k or it paid out as an IRA. Um, the rules would still be the same in terms of you're having access to it, but what might be different are some of the choices that you have because the company plan may not allow all the same benefits that you might get in an individual retirement account. Company plans can be more restrictive on what they put in their plan documents. It's one of the reasons um, 
yeah, that we generally encourage people to roll over so they're not they're not stuck with that um, scenario. So if you have that, you may still have the ability to roll those dollars now into your own IRA account from the 401k plan. All right, thanks, Chris. Uh, when with are the basic distribution requirement rules similar with IRA and 401k? Yes, they are generally similar with the exception if you are still working for the company where the 401k lives because in that scenario, as I mentioned in the presentation, is that you would have the ability to refrain from having to take the required minimum distributions with this, what they call the still working exception. So with the still working exception, it would say that you wouldn't have to start taking required or RMDs up until the time that you were no longer working there. And, and then uh, you would be forced to take an RMD by December 31st of the following year. Okay. Uh, number four, do you think Secure Act 2.0 will be passed by Senate by end of year? And will it push RMD year from 72 to 73 for those turning 72 in 2023? Ah, yeah, that's a good question. But you know, it sort of comes back to that very first slide that I mentioned, and that's uh, about focusing on the things that you have within your control. And that's <laughs> not one of those things that are in the scope of our control, just like the talking heads that are talking about what it's in the, what's happening in the markets any given day of the week. And not to minimize the question, it's a fair question. Um, what do I think will happen? I, I do think there'll be some changes there. Uh, generally, the most important changes that would take place uh, with those uh, uh, with those don't don't actually take place for uh, like the biggest step, I guess. I mean, in terms of the change uh, of the RM, of the RMD age, uh, doesn't take place for over a 10-year period. Uh, so 10 years or longer, I think it's nine or 10 years, something like that. I forget the exact year, but it's ways away. So I'm not overly concerned about that. A change from 72 to 73 is the, would be the first step, and that might be helpful, but it isn't. Uh, I mean, if you think what's the difference between one year is, well, okay, it gives you one more year to do an RMD, unless you're gonna do a large amount anyway, and if you're gonna do a large amount next year, maybe you could do the same large amount this year. So I'm not really overly concerned about a one year change, um, and I'm not sure it'll happen, but um, I do think we'll have some changes more specifically to the latter years, because that way nobody else will be affected. Um, the near term will be interesting to see how that plays out. Great. Can you combine, aggregate your RMD for a 403B tax sheltered annuity with a 403B7 invested in mutual funds? This is somebody who understands some of these different types yeah. of retirement accounts. I can see that there. That's a good question on the seven. Um, I have to check on that. But in general, you can aggregate our, you can aggregate distributions for 403Bs just like you can for IRA accounts. So if you have two different uh, 403 or, or two or more, uh, 403 Bs, you only have to take distributions from one as long as you take the appropriate amount, just like you would from an IRA. Uh, however, the 403 B7, I'm not really sure on that particular one, so I apologize, but I, I can look into that for you and get back to you if there's an uh, email or something. Yeah, if whoever submitted that question wants to send me an email with that question, then I'll uh, pass it along to Chris and he can answer that for you. Um, and we have one more question and, um, and then we're gonna wrap up for today. So if you didn't get your question in, again, send it to me via email. Chris is, is always happy to help out after the seminar too with the questions. Yeah, let so, me, I'm just gonna add to that real quick. And I only say this just to share with you. So when I'm answering those questions for you, I'm not just doing a Google research for you. I actually pay for having access to one of the most well-respected tax advisors in the country on behalf of our clients. So um, a lot of the information that you've heard today has come from some of the resources that I pay for. So I'll do my best to tap into those resources to help answer the questions from anybody that's coming in from this group um, if I don't know the answer myself. Okay, and then one more question. Would an inherited IRA from a divorce, not death, be in this realm? Say, say it one more time, I'm sorry. Would an inherited IRA from a divorce, not death, be in this realm? Ooh, that's a really good question. It's an inherited IRA from a divorce. Okay, so if it was already inherited, then no, because uh, if it was inherited, then that means that, so if it's from divorce is what you're saying. Let me think about this for a second, because it depends on whether the account was inherited, so he didn't pass away, still alive? It sounds like it. Well, if it's an so inherited IRA, there had to be somebody that was deceased 
Um, otherwise, it wouldn't be an inherited IRA. So it depends on if you mean by inherited that you received it from a divorce and that's how you inherited it, or it was inherited due, due to death um, and somewhere in there, there's a divorce. So I, I'm not really sure on that, but if it was just received from a divorce, then it will now technically be your own account and you would have the ability to essentially uh, just wait until your own RBD age to take the dollars out. The one caveat on that I'll mention while we're on the topic is one of the mistakes that often takes place when somebody gets dollars from a divorce, if they're under the age of 59 and a half from the quadro, is they take the dollars and, um, and then they roll them over into their IRA account. If you need the money, you want to take that before it's rolled over into the IRA account because otherwise you'll be subject to that too soon penalty, the 10% early withdrawal penalty. But if you get it directly from the quadro, then you would not be subject to that 10% penalty. So I don't know if that helps at all, but, um, and again, I'm happy to get more clarity on that question and answer it in more detail. All right, thank you so much, Chris, and thank you to the audience. Uh, again, if we didn't get to your question, please send it to me via email and I will uh, follow up with Chris and see if we can get the answers for you. So we're gonna um, wrap up for today and thank you again for logging in. We, will, we did record this seminar and it will be posted on our website probably sometime next week. So I will email everyone who registered, everyone whose email addresses I have to um, alert you that it is posted, give you the link and also attach the handout. I will also email those additional handouts Chris mentioned today and I'll try and do that yet this afternoon to those of you who, who um, I have your email addresses for. So we are, this, this concludes our seminar series for 2022. And by the way, I put up on the screen again, my email address and my phone number. So you're welcome to call or email me. And I will be, um, we are already planning next year's seminars. Like I said at the beginning, I hope we'll be able to be in person again next year. Uh, we do really enjoy talking to people rather than an empty room with chairs in it. So uh, we hope to be able to get back to that again next year and I'll keep you posted on that um, based on the situation with our, you know, with this pandemic and what we're able to do here at the hospital. So uh, one more thing too I wanna mention, we are planning already for Holiday Festival 2022. On the screen here, you have the dates, November 29 to December 4. We'll set up that big white tent in the parking lot over on Sky Park and Medical Center Drive. And we did get donated from Joe Jockerman at Martin Chevrolet, an electric vehicle this year. So it's, it's the, the picture is there. It's a 2022 Chevrolet Bolt um, Premier. And uh, so you can call the office at uh, 517-4703 in the 310 area code and uh, get opportunity tickets for that, or we just did a mailing too. So hopefully um, you receive something in the mail and uh, you can enter for a chance to win that electric vehicle. But do come and visit the tent and uh, see the beautiful work of the volunteers who are involved in that all year long. Thanks again for logging in and I wish you a great weekend and a wonderful holiday season. And I hope to see you again in January. Thank you. <laughs>